Hello, and welcome to the Calmix Talk with Reverend Sully. That's right, you have reached. The... <laughs> what are you doing? Pikachu. Listen, tomorrow we all have the day off in Boston, so we're celebrating our independence. Woo! Ha-ha! <laughs> hey, everybody. Oh, my goodness. Yul Carter's revenge. He has... Um... <laughs> do I do this, too. I'm in, a, I'm in a race with Fantinuum and Lane Kramer, apparently. Where do we put in the first comment at Yul Carter's uh, Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Pacific show? Well, comment, folks. Hey, JK. How are you today? We're doing a drunk stream. This is right. We have nothing else to talk about besides doing a drunk stream. I I, I had a very wet lunch at my local pub. I watched the first couple of innings of the Red Sox game. Uh, I love baseball. I, I do. And hopefully I can keep cohesion throughout today's episode and be able to de deliver to you all some um some interesting stories about comic books yes we have in our possession oh gosh you ripped it just ripped this bag i ripped the bag oh good thing I, it's it's that's not code for a you know a condom malfunction um this is the brown paper you the ubiquitous the ubiquitous brown paper bag that we get here at our local comic book shop Full of funny books. That's right. And um, I just tore it. I recycle these bags. I take them a few different times. They cost 10 cents each because it's a city ordinance that you should bring your own bag. So the establishment of any retail establishment has to charge you for the bag. You know, shops do do plastic. That's right. And do do plastics. I, I, I'm, I got too many menus. I, yes, JK's, uh, you know, shop does plastics and do, do plastics do do well for puppies. I know. I used to help walk my friend's dog. He was a huge chocolate Labrador, wonderful beast. His name was Moses, Mr. Moses Bungle. And he, walking this dog was the equivalent of trying to, you know, uh, water ski on land if you ever water ski you know that like you're just like behind the boat and you're holding on <laughs> yeah welcome to walking moses and he had the biggest poops and he was uh, he was a it was large for a for a chocolate lab he was he was just a full-grown chocolate lab he's passed god bless you moses i was happy to be your your dog father to Moses, I would pour some out, but um, I just got a little area rug and I don't want it to stink like the Boston Garden in here. <laughs> Hello, James. Good to see you too. Great advice that James is giving you right now. Please like, share, and subscribe. Uh, thank you, everyone that tuned into Wes's Thinking Critical yesterday. We had some fabulous conversation um, about comic books and pop culture and different things and it was wonderful because um you know it, it was such a such an interesting cross-section of people we had yule carter myself carrie from nerdy girl creates drew from comics elite and wes himself so we were like down a person we usually have a six person panel and we it was just like listen like we were all like there's something going around or something like, you know, I was feel you know, I was fighting a fever. I was, you know, uh, you know, I, I got up in time for the show and just, it was great that I was able to stick that long and not bail. And like, you know, I just, I was like, Oh gosh, I, I know what you mean. Woof. But, um, yeah, yeah. Yes. Is he? I'm not sure. Is he? I, I don't, I'm not sure. I mean, that's that, that's his. Um, I only have one Twitter name for him. But we have funny books to talk about. 
That's right. I have to get my shit together here. And um, let's see. I didn't get, I did not get a, a pirate chest full of Marvel Comics this week. I did read a couple. I did buy two at least. But overall, I mean, f f when it comes to doing the show, it's like oh, sometimes it happens. Sometimes it's just like because I'm like I literally depend on the kindness of strangers, like Blanche Dubois did in, in A Streetcar Named Desire. <laughs> Stella, uh, <laughs> hi Dwayne, how are you? Good to see you, man. Pups are a golden retriever named Robin. Oh, that's cool. After Damien, of course. Because, you know, Dam well, Damien is, like, you know, aligning himself with the social code. The code of Rob of the Robin. The, 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 the kid sidekick to Batman. Is I love, I could talk about Robin all day long. I usually do. Sometimes you're here for that. And so, yeah, I did not read. We didn't get a. Um, uh, that's fine. It happens. But I did get DC Comics and I did go shopping and I do have show notes and we are live. We're live and I'm a little tipsy, too. Um, why didn't we do live streams the past two weeks is a great question. Um, it's because I needed to hoard hours and it worked as of today. We are two hours away from breaking the 4,000 hour mark. That would probably be surpassed tomorrow, which I'll then, um, um, apply for partnership with YouTube. And thank you to everyone out there watching the channel, uh, for, especially the incel cast people that put, uh, you know, you really pushed me over the edge there. Uh, you did. You always do, though. Push me, you know. <laughs> Mike Jenkins, good to see you. How are you? Indeed. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, but I did, I did read how many bat, how many Batman comics, how many DC comics did I read this week? One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine different DC comics this week, including the ubiquitous brown paper bag full of not just this week's comics, but last week's comics too, because now I got a pull list. And now my FOMO has disappeared. My fear of missing out. Is that fear of missing out? Um... I have a poll list now. Yeah. And um, that's that. Yeah. I, I, I don't have to. It's my fault if I miss something because it, it'll it be like, you know, I, I could have put it on the list. You know, I get 10% off of those comics as well. 10% off of supplies. And uh, this is just new. It's because hopelessness took over. And you don't need hope unless you ask for help, you know. And I did, hence the poll list, you know. It just it gets, but it was the, the, it's the state of the biz and the industry and the direct market that, dude, you can go to your local comic book shop on any given Wednesday and not be able to get the new issue of something. And the show, the store has only been open for a few hours on the first day on new comic book day and it's the owners of the stores they they order they don't want to get stuck with stuff they can't sell unmovable unreturnable titles clogging up their precious marketplace, their shelf space. Wow, there's got to be a better way. And it's not paperless. The paper makes this artesian. It really does. And it makes it property. It does. 
Um, and thank you so very much. Yeah, we are literally two hours away. Because uh, every day that the YouTube studio odometer rises. And um, I'm literally at 3,998 public view hours on that clock. And to reach my 4,000 hour threshold for, uh, for partnership. It's been a long, strange trip. It took about four years. It's what I thought it would take. Actually, when starting this, this could take four years to get this vaulted partnership thing. Thank you, Phil. Phil the kill. And it's good to see everyone out there, too. I see. It's always good to see all the same familiar names we see in each other's chats and things and all, and all the good shows. And I, I really feel that Wes is thinking criticals, pulls us together. And Yule Carter's Fantastic Comics, his weekly show, and Max... Max von Priestley, uh, Max Phil von Priestley's, um, he, he's got a, a comic book show weekly. He's got two weeklies, right? A comic book, comics wrap up. He's also got, he's got a good show on Sundays. He didn't have it today because him and Kara and X-Ray Girl, his co-hosts, and also uh, my nerdy home, Steph, they were all, everyone was in Las Vegas this weekend uh, the, since Thursday for the FNT uh, meetup, their fourth annual. No, you didn't. You didn't meet our meetup. We're having a meetup in. Um, I know. I'm just messing. No, it's right here, right now. Welcome, Carrie. Nerdy Gold Creates. We were on a show yesterday. A West is Thinking Critical. That was great, and uh, we were down and dock, and um, that was like it's like we were a soccer team and we got a red card. And so we're going to be downed one one of our players the entire match. There's only going to be this one less player on the pitch. And that's how we, we co cover it. Cover the land. It's like a trio playing rock and roll like the Cream or Nirvana. You know, you see just or the police. You got like, you know, you got so much ground to cover. As a, you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> no, we, ju we, we just started. It was great. Thanks for coming by. And... Um, yeah, I mean, good to see you. Cheers. And we are drinking today because I drank yesterday and I got tomorrow off. So, woohoo! <laughs> that was earnest. But yeah, so I'm so, I am very blessed and grateful that, yeah, as of tomorrow, I will um, be. Um, applying for partnership here in the YouTubes. What does that mean for me in the channel going forward? I have no idea. I didn't expect incel cast. I didn't expect that to even take off, but that's, you know, what really did it was in, in an incel cast is just a clickbait title for my pre-existing gratitude list show here at the dojo for, for, for practical and tactical spirituality. It really is. It's like, hi -ya! That's right. You're going to get kamiyami between the eyes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Ladies and gentlemen, often duplicated, never reproduced. It's A.L. How you doing, kiddo? Oh, my goodness. I hope he's okay. Everyone send your prayers and your, your Genki Dama, your good chi. And you know what I mean? Like, you know, just we're going to send it to J.K. and her family and, uh, and her husband, who and I hope everyone's doing well and feeling happy. All righty, we're gonna let's get to some comic book reviews. Really, we're getting right into the comic book reviews. We are, you know, we'll see how long the show can go. We got some show notes. We're gonna. I promised on the title of the show. Let's cancel culture outrage. We're gonna. We're gonna go there. I'm going to do it. Why? Because I'm a little tipsy. And I'm going to just like, I'm going to let loose. I'm going to get outragey. I'm going to be dissatisfied. Deadly hands of selfie kung fu. That's right. Yeah. That's right. You know, we, you know. <laughs> there was that dojo up there in Andrew Square for a few years there. You know what I mean? 
up in, it was in St. Mary's, the Chester Hovers Parish, not up in uh, St. Monica's Parish there. <laughs> and, um, well, cool. Like, we read a lot of good comic books this week. I hope you're reading good comic books. I hope that you're still into it. I mean, I'm very happy that I get invited on Wes's show. Because apparently I'm some kind of weird kind of like positivity dude. Which suits me. And it suits my energy. And it suits how I feel about this stuff. And there's, I, I know all about the outrage. And I know that. You know, just like, oh, Disney's evil and or don't give money to people that hate you. And I, I respect that. I, I live by that. But I've refined that as well. So so when it comes down to like, you know, not giving money to people that hate me, I think a really good succinct lens and filter for that for this human, for your friend Eric, is the Twitter block out of like, seriously, I will say it once again, Tom King is the only creator i've ever had legit interactive beef with that merited the twitter block everything else is out of adjacency and white hatness okay and um i stand by that and i think it's a good filter to be like you know this is this is horrible don't like you know you know Oh, you know, well, it's yin and yang. It's it's just it's just like it's the balance of the force. You were supposed to bring balance to the force, not leave it in darkness. I hate you. As he's getting his pecker burned off on Mustafar. I love Star Wars. I love the Star Wars prequels. I always did. Um, I did. I love the Star Wars prequels. When they were coming out, I still have on my bookshelf right here at our at our very own comics coffee table. I always have in the prequel trilogies, um, novelizations. These are the ways to really enjoy the Star Wars prequel trilogy. It's just the movie's got its limitations, but the novelizations are really where it's at where it really kind of decompresses like inner inner dialogues that we, cause we don't have that plot device in star Wars of the, you know, soliloquy or inner thought. It's just, it's, it's, that's why they call it the documentary style, you know, without the voiceover, you know, and, um, you know, and, um, uh, but yeah, so we're celebrating the 25th anniversary of The Phantom Menace. I was alive and well. I was in a robust relationship. We were living together. We were both huge Star Wars fans of the same age. We went to opening night at midnight. And it was a really interesting experience because I brought my... I brought... My lightsabers with me, those same lightsabers, those two, that's Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon Jinn. I hadn't even seen Qui-Gon Jinn's story yet, and I already had his lightsaber. You know, this is 1999, a number, another summer. Get down! Ooh, sound of a funky drummer! That's from Public Enemy. <laughs> and... um I brought my lightsabers with me and I left them in the car so I wouldn't embarrass her. But I still have the story. I brought my lightsabers to the episode one Phantom Menace premiere. I also had the double-sided Darth Maul lightsaber. I lost that along the time. I gave that to an actual child. And I hopefully, you know, because it's the same thing. Batteries, flashlights, crack, Ben Burt crash lightsaber sounds. And um, I had that for a while, yeah. But yeah, that's, you know, I still have these 25 year old lightsabers up there. Yeah. And um, it was, it was interesting because I knew I got these at FEO Schwartz that were in the corner of Boylston Street and, and Berkeley Street in downtown Boston. And I already had seen, so I had seen the Padme, Queen Amidala slash Padme handmaiden Barbie doll. 
at FAO Schwartz. And the I had bought all three of the force uh, of the the Phantom Menace lightsabers, you know, first thing, you know. So I already knew about the reveal of the double-sided lightsaber. And so what what's what happened in this in Star Wars? A Phantom Menace was that my ex-girlfriend was so delighted. I was so spoiled on everything, and she was unspoiled. And I saw this viva la difference between the unspoiled and the spoiled. She enjoyed this movie a hell of a lot more than I did when I saw it. And I was jealous. And I wanted to reclaim that sense of kind of innocence that if I was a kid and I did not see Darth Maul pull out that double-sided lightsaber in the trailer or even on my toy, I would have lost my shit like a little kid in that movie theater 25 years ago in April of, you know, of, of 1999. And um, because of just the cool ass reveal, I mean, just, so I, be, because of Star Wars, I adopted a really deep and spiritual and serious prohibition on spoilers. So episodes two and three, I read the novelizations after I saw the movie. I still have my, my original hardcover copy of Matthew Stover's. Revenge of the Sith, which was based upon a screenplay, it, George's final screenplay, and then George went and did some pickup shots. And so you, there's a there is a a big there there is a difference. He also George also cut out George Lucas cut out Padme inventing the rebellion with Mon Mothma and Bail Organa. In Coruscant. Those scenes are available on the 2004 blue uh, DVD extras. They're there. They're also available on YouTube as well. Um, wow. We're talking about cancel culture in here. Nerdy Girl Creates is talking about cancel culture in K-pop. Really? I wonder. I mean, just uh, I feel like I never, you know, I guess so, because it's a smaller microcosm. It's just, you, got, you only, I'm, you know, K-pop might have the same amount of kind of fans as As, oh, sorry, I got distracted by Elithidor. Hey, hey, welcome. How's it going? Good to see you. <laughs> awesome. And uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. So, yeah, let's, uh, it's the 25th anniversary of The Phantom Menace. It's okay. What's, okay, check it out. The Phantom Menace, um, it was written by, by Terry Brooks. Uh, R.A. Salvadori does Attack of the Clones and Matthew Stover does uh, Revenge of the Sith. All great. All have kind of like cutting, like cutting room scenes, cut, you know, cutting room, the editing. You have to like, we have to get this down to two and a half hours, George. You know, no, you don't. You, you, we deserve a special edition of Revenge of the Sith. We deserve seeing Padme's scenes inventing the rebellion restored back into into actual fucking canon beyond the actual fucking canon of the novelizations. There's a scene in, in Phantom Menace where Anakin, as a child, has been sent by Watto across the Dune Sea to go procure some droids and droid parts on a speeder sled. Um, he's got 3PO. You remember 3PO's got no... no um, his parts are showing... You know, is with Anakin, and they're cutting across the Dune Sea. The storms are brewing. He's got to get home, or Watto's going to give him a beating. 
This is firmly established. It's also firmly established in the novelizations that Anakin Skywalker was a victim of abuse, of, of being beaten as a child, as a slave. He has got a history of traumatic events that help kind of format his, his adult choices. Um, Anakin Skywalker and 3PO cutting across the Dune Sea with this, all these droid parts comes across an injured Tusken Raider. Now, Anakin, at this point, is just full of hope, full of optimism, and full of getting chances. And even with against 3PO's warnings, he stops, he sets up a temporary tent shelter, and takes in the, the Tusken warrior and helps him, or the, him or her, them. In the morning, the Tuscan warrior is not in the shelter. Anakin leaves the shelter, exits the shelter, and he, there's a there's a ring of Tuscans around the shelter, and they're taking back their wounded brethren, and they leave, and they leave with Anakin's life, three PO, the speeder sled, and all the parts. That subtext. That subtext. And that's also set up to pay off because in the next episode, we have Anakin dispatching a tribe of Tuscans and the children, the women and the children. I hate them. Remember that? Teen angst. Um, yeah, it did. It did. Did to all of us, yes. Yeah, and I think there is a... Uh, hey, Bungie, good to see you. Thanks for dropping by. Uh, I think there is a, uh, a, a story note in the Marvel comics, the current Marvel comics canon, that Anakin might have the dead Watto stuffed and in his collection on Castle Mustafar. Am I wrong? Am I right? Let's ask some Star Wars experts. I am a 51-year-old original generation Star Wars fan. But am I an expert? No. I know some experts out there are in Twitter land. They're pretty fun. But let's get to some comic books. Awesome. So we have a, a sack full of comic books. And we've got some DC comic books that we read. Um, We read... The Batman, The First Night, number two, written by Dan Jurgens, And um, really good art, too. Stand by. Uh-oh. Hold on. Hold up. All the blood! Ah! I've never done that before. Isn't interesting, yeah. But if you want to enjoy the prequels, I enjoyed them. And then came the Red Letter Media um Mr. Plinkett reviews, which threw a new spin on it, and it threw and it gave you a lot of information about film theory, about you know there's just there's a lot of information in the Mr. Plinkett Red Letter Media Star Wars prequels critiques. Now it suffers from skit coma, especially by Revenge of the Sith, yet um, it works. It still holds up, especially the criticisms. I mean everything. That red letter me red letter media lays down. It, it still holds up. 
But yeah, so we've got um, where did it go? Where, 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 should, where where'd the thingy go? Give me the thingy. That's what the, that, that's just a quote from one of my favorite comic books, Casanova, um, by Matt Fraction and Gabriel Ba and Fabio Moon. Batman the First Knight, number two. Um, really good art. <clears throat> Decent story. It's black label, so there's swearing going on. And um, um, actually, I have some friends that read all the, the pre-2012 books, and it's just like, I go to them for verifications of information because it's like you guys know so much more than me like you know i might have started off reading that stuff like i started off reading dark horses dark empire and then the timothy zahn trilogy and then came lucas film story group book division with they had something new they had a shared continuity now, if you look over at Pocket Books, Star Trek had these paperback novelizations going on since 1980. Um, the first book is called The Entropy Effect by Vonda McIntyre. And it's still probably one of the best Star Trek stories you might have never heard of. And then there are just, there they are cheap paperbacks after that just like they're called pocket paperbacks but the thing about the star trek ones they what they sold i mean this licensed property and their stories told in universe but it did not contribute to an overall continuity it didn't unless it was specifically an arc story which kind of happens as later in the mid 80s the mid to late 80s with the star trek books where you now have like the Dreadnought series, like Yesterday's Sun, which was based upon an episode where, you know, Spock has Pon Far with, with Zarabeth, and they he leaves behind her pregnant with Zar, his son, this half Vulcan, you know, half humanoid, you know, Conan warrior. And Yesterday's Sun goes back a few times and brings Zar into the present. Uh, it, it, it's really good stories. If you like Star Trek books, there's a huge amount of Star Trek stories out there. You probably can get them like really cheap on Amazon used on Kindle or even on uh, Audible. I, I love audiobooks. I really do. And uh, but that's the thing that but Star Trek had the pocket books going since the, like 1980. And so here comes Lucas Story Group, like Lucas Art Story Group, with this new shared continuity. Everything matters. So the Star Wars Marvel comic book ended at issue 107. Okay. Now Dark Horse has the new license. Now we're going to have Ballantine Del Rey Books continue to publish these new Star Wars stories. And the Thrawn Trilogy by Timothy Zahn was the first. So you had this double punch of Dark Empire over on uh, over on Dark Horse Comics. Um, and then you have Timothy Zahn's trilogy. And then we had Shadows of the Empire. And then like this, this but that was the the say la difference between Star Trek and Star Wars. Star Trek did not have an interconnected continuity. That was cumulative and mattered. Now you had certain arcs that did even take William Shatner's. You know, William Shatner wrote his. He, he was actually a. Yeah, he had a bunch of sci sci fi books. Tech War, the T, T E K. He, that was tech. It was some kind of. Uh, it was a future drug. And uh, there was a TV show based on it too. With a, It was detective noir stuff. Dude, that was the that was the 1990s, but what the one thing that that uh, but Star Wars had continuity, and that was new. That everything mattered, even something such as the courtship of Princess Leia. 
this fluffy little romance book where like um, there's just so many like because everything you introduce in these book these books contributes to canon. Yes, I mean, gee. sorry. Well, it is the Phantom Menace's 25th anniversary. I don't mind talking about Star Wars. I love Star Wars. I am a G one. Star Wars fan. AL is like, I, yes. I mean, oh gosh, I love some of those Star Trek books. There's some good stuff. And um, Phil the Kill says, you watch Star Trek? Yeah. Star Trek Six, The Undiscovered Country. Um, all, I mean, just all of those movies. I'm a huge Star Trek fan. You see those. The eagle moss in the background. I have a fleet. I have a star fleet of tiny models of these. I just love having an authentic replica of the most original series Star uh, Enterprise. I mean, that just pleases me. I'm such a I'm such a nerd. I'm such a geek. But we so we are talking about comic book reviews. This is the review show, right? And then we're going to talk about. Get the culture outrage! I'm going to talk about it! Pronouns! No, not. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm such an asshole. What? <laughs> Duckies and bunnies. Duckies and bunnies. Duckies and bunnies. So yeah, the Batman First Night issue number two. I did not read the first one, and so issue two was very easy to get into. It was an easy read, and it was long. And it was oversized. Got great art. It's set in a mythical 1939 with a, where you it's steampunk, but it's just not steampunk because it's like a little post-industrial. I mean, because you know, it's just, uh, the Electric Age. It was just it's set in a 1939 Gotham. And it's just really good. It's Black Label. It's DC Comics. It's Batman. And are you reading it? Are you reading Batman First Night? I, I this was good. I was I really enjoyed the hell out of that. Suicide Squad Dream Team Number Two. Um, I liked it a lot. Um, I like the first issue and this thing kept it going. So it's, it's a, it's a four issue. It's, a, it's, it's a four issue mini. Um, window. No, here we go. Here we go. It's a four issue mini, uh, was it Natalie Maines? Uh, but it's, it's it's art, but it, it, we have we have line art by Eddie Barrows, and um, that's an advertisement for Tom King. Oh my gosh! Look at these panels. Look at the look at the shadowing and the hatching and the line work. Look at the on look at the the the, the hand drawn on a monopeia. I mean, just I look at the panel progression. Just this is really old fashioned, good storytelling. Look at that hand drawn on a monopeia. And this is so, this is Dreamer. I, who cares? You know, um, look at that hand drawn on a monopeia. I mean, look at these panels. This is really good art. This is really good story told. And so, this is Nicole Maines is the writer. Eddie Barrows is the penciler. Ebert Ferreira is inking, and we have we have a decent comic book. We really do. And one thing I want to um, come back to is the cover. And this look up here, countdown to absolute power. That is called trade dress, and that is so familiar to me. When it comes to an event and a crossover, I mean, I'm really enjoying the hell 
out of Suicide Squad Dream Team. I did not expect to be liking it as much as I am. I'm grateful for that because it's so it surprised me. It really did. Um is it woke? He said woke again. Ah! Um no, it's not. Um, and that's maybe why it's why it's pleasing to me because you don't have to, you know, you can you can inform people about this character and their identity and who they are and what what it's like it's a superhero story, and it this is where it works. I'm into this, and um, this is the one I'm want. I want to tell you, you might be sleeping on Suicide Squad Dream Team issue number two, perhaps issue number one. It's a four issue limited. I really like it. I might have to go back and buy it. We also have um, The Outsiders number six by Lansing and Kelly, and well, this book has got it still. Ha it still has. It still has Dawn of DC on its trade dress. It says, welcome to the place between pages. Now, if you know your Grant Morrison Animal Man, specifically issues 24, 25, and 26, the end of his run, Grant Morrison reintroduces a concept that was brought back you know, in, in, in the early 80s. Limbo. It's a space in the multiverse that it's not the bleed. It's outside the bleed. But it's also outside of the, the local and the, maxim, the maximum multiverse. It is, um, it's where characters who aren't being used, forgotten characters go. And they live on this like quintessential lost island of just like, it's it's like and they of just like they, nothing happens there they're just being until someone remembers them they're going to be living here in limbo and so this is going to be the strongest issue of the series it has a reveal of uh, the real identity of one of the one of the uh the characters that has been a bit um where is my mouse? Okay, there you are. Hi. <laughs> um, but I, you know, for Lansing and Kelly, I mean, they're really hit or miss for me. I really enjoyed their uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, with Ke especially because it was the art by Kev Walker that really nailed that book for me. But it was like, I mean, even Thunderbolts number four out of four was okay. One, two, and three, not so much. But Outsiders, you know, number six here, it ties back into what they're aping. And this is this is planetary. This is, it is dovetailing into planetary. So we've had five issues that's been leading up to, is this some kind of weird planetary knockoff? And they're dovetailing back into canonical authenticity they still might be trying to pull off some warren ellis fanfic yes but um at least it got better with over six issues i mean the first couple of it maybe maybe if i went back because something like this is like what I keep saying. It's it's written for the trade paperback. This is so there's an illusion of the serialized format. Would this story have been best told in a more collected format if you didn't have to have the mitigation of time? And the illusion of a print publication, of a serialized print publication, couldn't you have just maybe have enjoyed the story a bit more when it's all together? You know, it is. Did you did you did you read it though? 
did you, did you check it out? I like stories about limbo, you know, cause stories about limbo, like you have Grant Morrison is usually gone there. Uh, animal man who was 89, uh, in volume one, um, issues 24 and 25 when animal man finds himself in limbo with merry man, the mayor of limbo and finding all these different characters. And then Morrison himself revisits this same limbo in Final Crisis, specifically in Final Crisis, Superman Beyond 3D, uh, issues one and two, art by Doug Mankey. Great use of the action figures, in my humble opinion, with 3D and 3D glasses. And uh, I, 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 for one, love that one, especially, too, because it has... It has the most traditional version of Captain Marvel from the from the Fawcett universe in there is being part of the team. He's not Shazam. He's not the captain. No, this is Captain Marvel of, of, of Earth S of the Fawcett you know, universe. You know, um, I like that. When, and um, what else do we have? Oh, we read Speed Force number... Number six of six, and this has. Um, I've read all of this, I can't tell you who the blue chap is. I think that might be Mas and Manos in the background here. There are speedsters from the Teen Titans Go show that made it that graduated, and I believe the first appearance canonically was in Final Crisis number one by Grant Morrison and JG Jones. I love that. This is why we're part. Well, this is why we're here. We having this ongoing comic book conversation, and that you know, if if I was drinking this beer, if I was monetized, <laughs> youngling Phil is Miller Lite, Heineken, Heineken. Pops Blue Ribbon! It's from, um, that's Frank Booth from David Lynch's Blue Velvet. <laughs> Too many speedsters. Aw. I know. And uh, this, it still has the Dawn of DC trade dress. And um, let's look at some art. It's you know, at least that's a hand drawn on a monopeia that shatter. Okay, it happens once in a while, and there's some pretty decent. This thing actually changes hands a few times. Um, this is probably the best art in the book. And here's the end of it, you know. <laughs> They're all just hanging around playing video games. Speed Force out. And that's just, that's uh, you know, but before that, everything else in this book was like was a visual nightmare. See, look how look how that art style changed. You know, that was just like exactly. I mean, like there you go. See that? See that rip? That's like that is cut and paste on a monopeia. And look at that lettering too. It's just I'm not trying to bag on the creators, but it's more of like look at that background down here and this crowd shot. I mean, it's I mean this is lazy. I'm sorry. I, I am. Yeah. And it's like, I don't mind Wallace West. I mean, I, I would, you know what I like on Wallace? I like his, um, get that silver outfit that he had in the new, like, you know, it was somewhere between new 52 and rebirth when they just started introducing him. His dad is John West, the unknown brother or previously under disclosed brother of Rudolph West. 
Rudolph Wells West is Wally's traditional Wally, redhead, green eyed, uh, white Wally. Uh, <laughs> Rudolph West and is is brother to Iris West, and so John is their brother. John was introduced in Flash number one, New Fifty Two, by Francis Manopole, and he became the the first Reverse Flash of the New Fifty Two, and his son was named Wallace West. And he had a, you know, he, he was a mixed child. You know, he had an African-American mom and, and, and a Caucasian dad. And so for a couple, this was supposed to have, this, Wally West was supposed to have been race swapped. This has never been proven. There's no evidence besides my own linear timeline of seeing how things connect. And, that who we know today is Kid Flash, Wallace West, was supposed to have replaced the red-headed, green-eyed kid from Blue Valley, uh, Nebraska. Originate, you know, original member of the Teen Titans. And uh, for Syzygy, for corporate Syzygy, because over at the CW, you have the Grant Gustin TV show where you have a race-swapped West family. Do you see how the pieces fit? I know because I watched them fall away. That's a tool reference. Um, tool being it's a band. Yeah, let's see. Where is. Um, Sinister Sons. Sinister Sons. Um. Yeah. Oh, okay, there we go. Sinister Sons is not doing it for me. Seriously, I uh, it's issue three. I want to like it. This is going to be Peter Tomasi's last DC Comics comic book. He's returning to the same kind of quell that he laid down in Super Sons, which was a resounding of success that got, you know taken away from us. Thank you, Bendis. But, um, I am... Yeah, Sinister Squad. Sinister Sons isn't doing it for me. I am giving a generous learning curve to, um, to Joshua Williamson's Batman and Robin. I'll tell you that much. I'm being really nice to it. Why? Um, here we go. Let's share the screen. There we go. Uh, we have cover art by Simone Di 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 Matteo, who's been doing the interiors for the majority of this. Yet, um, is it, si it says Simon uh, uh, says Maya. Sis I see, see, I'm sorry if I butchered your name. Hopefully, I came really close. You know, I, uh, it's Batman and Robin, and it's about uh, a very teenage Damien. You know, my favorite kind of Damien is the same, my favorite kind of Dick Grayson or even Tim Drake, or, you know, the younger the better. You know, have it when, when Grant Morrison introduced Damien Wayne. In the pages of Batman before Final Crisis, uh, he was 10 years old or 9 or 10 years old. He was the most deadliest 9 or 10 year old in the DC universe. You know, he was already a stone cold killer raised by the League of Assassins. And now he's 15 and in high school. And so this is a... It's kind. Of, it's a CW kind of like. See, do you see the line work on on on? Let's see. Can I can I pull this up? I can't. Man, I mean, oh, I you can't. Do you see? You can't see what I see. I'm looking at this hatching effect on her collar. If you can see the cursor moving here. Here on her arms, under the inside of her elbow, 
this is just some kind of digital cut and paste effect. There are not, this is not, it's it, okay. You cut that out or let the door, you know what I mean? It's just because <laughs> I get it. I am all about dirty jokes. Um, I love, I was a kid and Robin is your vehicle, your safe space in a dangerous place that Batman would never let anything bad happen to Robin. Because probably that's why, you know, death in the family was so tragic and huge was because it's just, that was, and that was a little bit out of Batman's hands too, because Jason went off and did his own thing. To be honest. Um, yeah, but this is, it's, I'm giving this one a major, um, I'm being nice to it because um, it's Joshua Williamson. He's doing what I call the yeoman's work. The yeoman's work means it's an old cliche. I mean, it's like the yeoman is the person that shows up to work every day, does the job, not just gets it done, but gets it done so satisfactorily that you don't see any interruption in service, that everything's smooth. And, so Williamson is writing Batman and Robin, Superman, Green Arrow. Uh, he got a crisis and cri a dark crisis on Infinite Earths. Um, he's also writing Duke and Cobra Commander over on Skybound. Um, I'm probably missing a few things too. Joshua Williamson's doing the yeoman's work. He's doing a lot of things. I might not be buying Green Arrow. I might, you know, but I am buying Superman and I have been buying Superman all year and I've been enjoying it. I've been, you know, I bought all of Dark Crisis. That's what, like, you know, brought me back in. So, I mean, it's been, I didn't buy his Flash. I actually came back for Jeremy Adams' Flash. But I got to say, like, you know, Joshua Williamson right now might be the authoritative voice of DC Comics. And I know that you got Mark Wade in there, too. But let me tell you, Joshua Williamson is 100% more likable. And likability goes a long way. It really does. Yeah, those are the DC Comics we read, right? Is there something we missed? Did we miss anything? Let's see. Green Lantern number 10. Oh, stick a pin in that. Dylan Dog number two. Action Comics 1064. Intermission. Do, 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 do. I, I guess I can share this part of the program with you. You know, it's like identify that sound. Fan fans of Yule Carter's show will know that sound. <laughs> I know. Sorry about that. Just like, you know, stuff happens. Um, 
Yeah, let's get to what's in the bag. Here we go. I, I recycled these bags. I've used this bag over like four times over already. Um, and so it's it's lived life. It's going to go into the trash bag uh, to absorb all the, the wet coffee grounds. I put it into the kitchen trash. So I actually add a bit of paper trash bags to my kitchen trash, if only to absorb all the wet stuff I throw in there daily. Like, seriously, wet coffee grounds, you know, every morning. A little tr brown paper trash bag. It, it really helps with, you know, you know, not having a puddle behind you. But what do we got this week? Let's see. What's in the bag? What's in the bag? Oh, outrage. Fucking pronouns. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. I, I should have taken the hat off. You give me the. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, I feel like Lorraine Bronco and Goodfellas. I'm sorry. <laughs> what do you mean you throw it out, Karen? That was it. That's all we had. I got some books from last week. I didn't go to my store last week um, because I have a pull list, so I no longer suffer from FOMO, fear of fear of missing out. FOMO. And um, this is Last Mermaid issue two. I don't even know how long this is lasting. It's going to be like three or four issues, but it's uh, it's interesting. Look, behold, look at these unique format. It's, it's completely square. So I don't have a bag or a board to give this comic. I don't even think it would just do that to like, you know, gain whatever collectability the only i mean you, know, you have to face it scarcity is what drives the market for you know this and then comes um condition scarcity then condition i mean you know but i don't have any bag that or board that's going to accommodate this but it's a it's it's a really interesting spin on 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 a classic archetype of character, the Little Mermaid, the Last Mermaid, and it's actually got environmental themes to it. It's got a it, you know it's got is it activist themes? Is 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 there? It's 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 science fiction. It may or not may not be set on this planet. It's just um, scarce ability. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Thank you for coming by, Mark. And thank you. Yeah. We invent words here. We are wordsmiths. Let's invent words. A magazine and board. That's what, okay. That Thank you, Dwayne. That's a good idea. Thank you. I don't have any magazine bags or boards. So, you know, I've, what else, you know. Why don't you get some? Come on. What, and get them at your local comic book shop. That's where I get my bags and boards. Oh, boy. Let's see. What else do we... What else ha, we, we got... We happened upon last week was Neil Pafor's Zod issue 4 of 12 by Joe Casey and uh, Dan McDade. This is just like Act 1. This is the end of Act 1. If you take four issues... Times them by three, you get twelve, and you'll get twelve issues of this. So this could be the act, the end of Act One. If if this is following a three act story structure, it might not. We don't. We won't know until it's done. Let's keep reading. But this is a DC comic. Look, Donna DC trade dress still there. Okay. Um, this is it's got interesting art and it's got interesting panel progression. You know, it's pacing, it's storytelling, it's camera work. These are storyboards for a camera. I mean, camera I mean, panel progression is is we don't talk about it enough. We should be talking about can panel progression all the time. Neil Pavorzad, um, it's a good clinic 
and the like you know the basics of comic book storytelling i'm here i'm glad i'm here for it and um and look ads on, on it's for six flags and this is the back ad on your floppy this is primo real estate we, always, we like to look at the ads here. But yeah, I mean, it's um, it's letting a bad guy be a bad guy and make bad guy choices and, and showing bad guy results. I mean, it's not it's not my it's not Michael Shannon in the Zack Snyder movies. It's not Terrence Stamp. In the Donner, you know, era movies. But in here, he's imagining having a conflict with his rival, Jor-El, the father of Kal-El, who we know as Clark Kent Superman. And Jor-El is dressed in his most silver age, his golden silver age kind of, outfit not the most recent one we saw in rebirth with with bendis i mean I, I like that i like that a lot um and here's some ads we get some like you know you know legacy 300s coming out soon that's cool um tom taylor is wrapping up his his run on nightwing People like that run. Um, yeah, here's just some. I mean, I just, this is a good comic book. <laughs> it really is. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm glad I'm tuned into it. There's just some good action. There's just some good, just pacing. It's just, and look, yeah, Six Flags. I thought Six Flags had one. They had the Superman rides and the Batman rides and stuff. And uh, we, because we had okay, and here in Boston, we don't have many amusement parks around us. So it's about an hour and a half drive down to Agawam, Massachusetts, which also has the lowest postal zip code in the in, in the union. I believe it's zero 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 one zero. I grew up in O two one two seven South Boston. You know what I mean? We have the lowest zip codes here in Massachusetts. It's where it started. Uh, it's called Agawa, Massachusetts. It was called Riverside Park. And you had a flume ride. had one of those pirate ship things. It had a big-ass fucking roller coaster. I never... I, I hate roller coasters. No thank you. I love arcades. I love funnel cake. And, um, you know, just... But no, no, no thank you. Uh, <laughs> but then it got bought out by Six Flags. As a when it franchised, you know, expanded. So this is Six Flags New England now, and now it has the licensed rides, like I believe that's the Superman ride or the Supergirl ride, and a Batman ride. So they change up, and just licensing and stuff and packaging. But um, but yeah, so Neil before is odd. That was like that's good. Uh, Rick Remender is back with Max Fuyama. Fuyama. Uh, uh Mara, Max Fuyumara. Sorry, uh, this is Sacrificers number seven. I am so completely lost, but I have everything else, so it's um, I just have to reread it real quick and just get back into it. It had a hiatus of like two or three months, which is fine. I mean, like. If you're going to take a break, don't take a break like Fables or Saga. That will completely kill your title, as we've seen. I mean, but Sacrificers, you know, it's back on track. I also picked up um, Rook Exodus number one. It, look at that. $3.99 cover price. Cardstock cover. 60 pages. Of story and art by Jason Fabuck and Jeff Johns. This is this is good stuff. This is this got that this got it, man. 
this is a key issue too. This is the first appearance of Rook in Exodus and all of this universe and characters. Get on this, please. And it does not have the unnamed war trade dress on it. So will this have anything to do with the overall newly minted the unnamed war tie-in that seems to be going on with these the unnamed yeah here it is get the unnamed war see that yeah this was great yeah i yeah we were getting a lot of love for that in the chat brooke was fantastic brooke, brooke was great yeah i mean the jason Fabuck is just ripping this thing up and i had to go back and get me a copy of that it's going back to a second printing if you get your first printing let's look at the indicia I mean, I mean, the UPC, uh, this is the UPC code. Okay, come on, focus, focus. Here we go. Zero, zero, one, one, one. Zero, zero, one means this is the first issue. The first one there means the, uh, the cover, cover A, and the second one means the printing. So this is the, you know, here you go. Get yourself your first edition, you know. Yeah, but why not? Comic books are fun. It looked at yeah. I liked Red Coat, and Geiger was okay. You know, and yeah. I mean, and then the Tomasi stuff comes out. We haven't. This is we've only seen the Jeff John stuff. Tomasi's got his own Ghost Machine shit, and this is just it's only just begun. So. This is really cool. I mean, also, I can see, like, I'm not into the Ripperverse stuff, but I can see why people are into it. It's new, and it's like we're just finding out everything. Yeah, I watch a lot of EVS, so it's like I end up watching a lot of Eric July because he's making fun of him. But I'm also like, oh, give the guy a break. I mean, I know, like, you know, you, he pissed you off, but come on, man. Just like, you know, he's, he's just, it's still new. What else do we got for this week? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six comics, six floppies just from this week right here. Uh, hey, Brandon, the anime guy. Good to see you, buddy. And I also got a uh, crowdfunder that came in too. Um, if you saw, uh, if you saw me on West yesterday, then you have you've been spoiled. But let's do it. What's this com this week's comic books? And I'll uh, just once we are live, and I am I've been drinking since lunch. I caught the first couple of innings of the Red Sox game at my local pub and had uh, a really nice plate of wings and a couple of pints of Guinness. Then I've come home just in time to talk comic books for a little bit, for about an hour or two with you guys, because this is what we do on Sundays. And we love talking about comic books. And I hopefully you'll get some, you know, some suggestions. I'm, wow, so I got three Marvel books, two DC books, And one Skybound image book. Yes, it's Transformers number seven. Holy shit. The memes of destruction is here. Now we can break out the nachos. <laughs> Good to see you, memes. Uh, come back to Boston. Let me know. We'll get we'll you know we'll hang out. Um I love this cover. It's done by Philip. Uh, this is done by Daniel Warren Johnson. Like again, let's look at the UPC. Code, all right. Look at look at those numbers real quick. Whoops. Zero zero seven one one. This is issue seven, first printing, first cover. This thing is Transformers, so it's got a lot of different covers. Hey, I'm Griffin. How you doing? Good to see you. I love martial law. What a great icon you got there, man. Hey, Doctor Nitrogen. Wow, everyone's showing up. Happy Sunday. It's 
We're talking about New Comic Book Day, and we're also going to get into some outrage. Fucking pronouns! I, re I remember to take off my hat that time. <laughs> just, the things we do as YouTube creators to get clicks, you know? <laughs> nobody clicked that. I hope nobody clips that. I don't want that getting out into the world. <laughs> this is fun. Okay, uh, uh, Jorge Corona does the art in this. And um, this is like seamless with what Daniel Warren Johnson just laid down. Now, if you look here, like my own, my only, my only critique is this, look at all how this is a loud comic book. Okay. All of those onomatopoeia are cut and paste. All right. Now, Daniel Warren Johnson, um, does a lot of hand drawings. Uh, memes, um, uh, the uh, June 16th through 19th is the uh, Boston Fan Expo, and it's going to be at the Heinz Convention Center. And if you get a day pass or anything, let me know. Thomas might be going, Thomas Gilkey, uh, myself, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start up something in the on the direct messages. I actually, I'm very blessed in uh, Memes of Destruction is, um, he's a dude on YouTube. He does smart shit. And um, I met him in real life a couple of, more than a couple of times. We were, we're connected into a, um, through the live chats of these shows. Um, March 4th, 2022 was when we all met for the first time. Uh, brightest Day, Macklin made it, Dr. Rachel Lindbergh, um, just, uh, Pope Metallicus, Thomas Gilkey, myself, D-Day Direwolf, Memes of Destruction, um, you know, D Brian Buchanan, uh, Marcus, Lin uh, uh, Marcus. Um, there's just, there's a local nexus of people that we will all, meet up for the conventions and occasionally dinner in one of these nerdy movies. And it's just, um, and, and it's nice that, so if you, you can like meet up with people, meet up with people. So yeah, Transformer seven was, was really good. Uh, the art change was not unpleasant. It wasn't bad. Uh, we have, speaking of art change, we have Hulk number 11 written by Philip Kennedy Johnson art by Danny Earls. Um, I'm used to and spoiled by Nick Klein. <laughs> oh no, you pig! Drinking all this beer flavored beer. Indeed, not a disappointment story wise. It's just not my. I'm 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 just not thrilled with the with the art. Once again, Hulk is a loud comic book. And all, you know, and Nick Klein has been gifting us with hand drawn onomatopoeia. And this is just cut and paste, drag and drop. Good to see you, JK. Thank you so very much for seeing, you know, I hope you and Kidder are doing awesome. And thank you for coming by. You can catch up on the rest of the show later when you get more time. That's the whole, you know. Uh, I like the holographic nature of the show where we just like tune in and um, I think like the, we have a freshness date. Like there's like a week freshness date on the show or something like that. Um, so yeah. So tomorrow I should be breaking 4,000 public view hours and uh, becoming at least you know, subscribe, you know, putting my name in, you know, for, uh, for, for, for being a partner on YouTube. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but I mean, the, the story itself was okay, but like, like I say, like, look, all this onomatopoeia and all like, look, look at those, did look at the art. It's just, it is, 
this is all drawn like by on 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 a. It looks like it's drawn on a on a tablet. I'm sorry. I mean, organic line has charm. Thank you. Yes, I would never have done it with all without the help of all you. Thank you. Seriously. But yeah, I mean, so it was okay. I mean, like it's not my favorite art. Uh, it's not the first time Nick Klein has had like you know a fill-in artist on this. It's good that we've got Nick Klein for as long as we do. And um, I'm still tuned in. I still like it. And it's okay. So uh, it just wasn't my favorite part of the series so far. Speaking of not my favorite part of the series so far, we've got Ultimate X-Men number two written and drawn by Peach Momoko, part of the new Ultimate. And so hey, look, we've got a new Denny's Camps, Juan Frigari doing the Ultimates team. It's got Lady Sif. It's got Thor. It's got Ant-Man or Giant-Man. Reed Richards, who looks like uh, Doom. Tony Stark, the Iron Kid, who looks like a version of Kang. Um, and, and Steve Rogers, the unfrozen archetypical moral compass of any team. But we get Ultimate X-Men number two. We have this is a key issue. Um, it's the first appearance of Maystorm, girl with st storm like powers. See issue 00211. That means okay, this is issue two. This is cover A, and it's first printing. Nothing. Um she's already married. Dude, if she was single, then we would talk. Hopefully. Call me. <laughs> um, I believe that the big bad in this is going to be the Shadow King. And that character has never, ever, ever, never, ever, ever <laughs> caught on with me. My friends talk and your friends talk and they all talk to me. Ooh, 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 ooh. That's right. We are never, ever, ever getting back together, Shadow King. I, I just never have been a fan of Shadow King and any of the X-Men or New Mutants books. <laughs> I just It's a waste of a character. And I just doesn't... I. I skip those ones. I know they exist. They're in the continuity. Someone can mention them. Sure. But like, I just, I don't read them. Just no thanks. It's, I skip them. I always have. I just, I'm so oblivious to Shadow King. Even like the, the, the episodes of the old animated series in 92, you know, like, oh God, Shadow King. No. So it's, at least it's, at least I'm consistent. So I like the art and I like what they're what she's doing, but it's Shadow King all the same. So it's Mayfair, it's May Storm in armor versus Shadow King so far, and uh, that's what it feels like. And um, what else do we got? We've got a couple more funny books. Our, we've got issue seven, Sabretooth War Part Seven, issue forty-seven of Wolverine. Um, it's got some interesting look at it. great panels, some good action scenes. I mean, it's not great art. This one's got to get, I gotta say, he's got the weakest art that I've seen in the series so far. But I mean, it's just, it's, 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 it's still, it's, it's, it's like Igor Cordy's art in the middle of all of this, Frank Quitely, even in Ant Skyver and Mark Silvestri stuff. If you look at it, like if you look at New X Men. You know, something like that. It's just like, oh, someone threw in a uh, a um, a pickup artist for this one, and it's not terrible. It's not the best one, uh, but all the same, Marvel has my fifty dollars. See, it's a four ninety nine cover price. 
0-4-7. It's issue 47-1-1. It's, it's the first printing, and it's the A cover. But there are 10 parts to this Sabretooth War. Marvel has me for $50 in floppies. And look at Blood Hunt. Oh, we have a Paul Neary tribute page. I mean, we've been Mark Bright, Paul Neary, um, some other people. But this inside cover, I like this. You know, the art of Marvel storytelling. It's about now, isn't that cool? I mean, and look, we got some in the Indicia page, your checklist page. That's your preview art page for that's going to be the next cover. Yeah, it wasn't it was it wasn't terrible. It was okay. It was okay. It was okay. All right. We only got two more comic books left and one crowdfunder, and then we can get to outrage. Your fucking pronouns! I'm not mad at Az. I fucking been watching him for a couple of years now. <laughs> but uh Hmm. I did not buy the past three issues of this. Let's launch it. Look, six flags. Go all out. Buy now. Get a free diamond upgrade. Visit Six Flags. This is Action Comics 1064. Let's look at that. Did they get one more digit? No, it just clocked over. The odometer went up to... to, to so this is issue 1064. So it says 064. One, one. We still have the Dawn of DC trade dress. I got this because it's Joshua Williamson. Rafa Sandoval's doing the art. When I was overall impressed with just the book itself. It just it just it starts fast. It keeps going fast. It's using grid. It, look, look, we got a nine panel grid, and then we got some like it's this is just all introduction. We're just like setting up story here. There's nothing wrong with any of this. I kind of like it. I want, and then poof, we've got a really nice. You can't you feel the spray in the mist of the water on your face right now? And if you don't, then what's wrong with you? Well, you might be from Arrakis. <laughs> Tell me of your home world, Lucille. This is just part one. And I like this. You see, the, you see the trade dress on the top of this issue, House of Brainiac. And look at that. That, that one with the with the with the um, the triangle there with the three points that are that are iconic with Brainiac's head. Okay, that's also reminiscent of an age of Superman comics where the all the Superman family books tied in and so like the numbers that they had on this little superman logo under under the the issue number that was like what you should be following if you're just like you know getting them sequentially you know big ass fucking that's a big ass you know that's metropolis what's that what are they that's lobo lobo is the last zarnian if Lobo is the last Zarnian, then what are all these other Zarnians doing there with some Brainiac robots dropping their asses on Metropolis, obviously trying to get Superman to come out and play? We'll find out here in the House of Brainiac. There's a House of Brainiac backup story here in Green Lantern. It's called Guy's Bogus Logo Lobo Adventure. 
It's written by Jeremy Adams, but it's got delicious fucking line art by Kevin McGuire, who drew uh, Justice League International in the late 80s. Um, this is just... This is this is pretty funny. Uh, Jeremy Adams is bringing back these wrestling characters that he, he introduced in Flash, and it's just I'm I'm all I'm for that. I like some I like fun, fun's fun, and um, see this this is just enough fun. See we got all this seriousness too. Like I was thinking, like why did the New Lantern? Why did like the why did they mess up the the Red Lantern logo? And they didn't because, no, that was a setup to a payoff. And that was because the new Lanterns can change color when they use different emotions. And it looks like that the, the, the Guardians are still trying to trap in, tap into the orange color of Larflees, of greed. Unsuccessfully because... The whole irony of the Green Lantern Corps is there's only one member. I love that stuff. But really good art by the K. Okay, Harmonico is kind of, he's grown on me a little bit. Okay. I do love the lack of, okay, design wise for Hal's costume here, this is a unification of the Silver Age look and his Modern Age look. Because the modern age look, they have the he has his logo here that's embossed and it's it's not flat. It's not part of the design of the fabric. What's going on? Uh, and it's there. It's actually a, a logo. And Ethan Van Skyver himself innovated the part where the logo itself is always flashing like a police siren. It has a holographic green lantern that shines from the center of it. And I just really like that. But look at his shoulders. That's what I'm trying to point on here. His shoulders lack the definition that happened in the late Bronze Age and Copper Age. Um, you know, they, they just taper the, the shoulder taper. Now, just the whole lack of that, that's completely Silver Age looking Hal Jordan. I like that. Um They've got some, you know, enhanced manhunter types of robots. Um, stakes have naturally risen. Look, this is issue what? Issue 10? And I'm still in. And uh, and its backup feature has, you know, a tie-in. It's an official tie-in of the House of Brainiac. So I'm basically in on House of Brainiac in my own way because... I'm already buying Green Lantern. I'm already buying Superman. I was buying action comics before Jason Aaron came on with his three issue brainy uh, Bizarro story. Just like Shadow King over an X Men, I avoid Bizarro stories. I did. They just don't do anything for me. Sorry, and. Um, but I know what I like. And it's just not a bizarro story. So I think I'm... I So will I be buying the one-shots? Will I be buying Power Girl? The tie-in. I'm already buying Green Lantern, which is tying in. Am I am I in for House of Brainiac? Did I get kind of passively suckered in? To an event comic. Well, we don't know. We'll find out. Together. Hold on one second.
What? Hold on. You know, I, I can't show this part or I'll get demonetized. I have to put that exactly. Thank you, Phil. Let's see, this is Phil knows what could be going on. Pass it over to me. All right. That's some good shit. Oh, well, what? <coughs> Don't cough it out, man. No, man. When you cough it out, you get even more stoned, man. You get harsh and you cough, but all the blood will go to your head. Hey, how is he supposed to have outrage if he's stoned on, like, good stuff that grows from the land, man? Um, I got a crowdfunded book in the mail through someone that I became internet friends with. Um, I remember the first time I had an interaction with Jesse Blaze Snyder, and this is before I knew like who he was and who his famous parent was. Um, I was just he was on a show. I might have been Latino slant or it might have been Midnight's Edge or we were talking, he was talking about Star Wars and he was being very positive about the, the sequels and about, you know, kind of like about, I, I remember I, I, I responded to him in the comment section and I was a little angry with what he said, or I interpreted it that way, kind of oversensitively, like, you know what I mean? Don't tell me how to feel. As, a, as an old fan with the new stuff. And then, like, he got right back at me. And then I was like, hey, you know what? Let me reframe. Let me say it like this. You know what I mean? So I came at it a little differently and more respectfully with less anger. And then, like, we came to an agreement and it, it was nice. And that's how I got to know Jesse Blaze Snyder. Uh, then months later, um, way leads to way. And uh, we just end up becoming, like, Twitter friend and um, really good guy, big Star Wars fan. His dad is D. Snyder of of Twisted Sister, and uh, Jesse has written comics for Marvel Comics. Um, and this is his um, crowdfunder. It's called King of Kings. This is the Kickstarter special edition. It's a floppy. Okay. And uh, look, there you go. There's twenty dollars. Yeah, but it's got this really good gatefold cover. It's got some really good art in this. It's created and written by Jesse Snyder and Mark Holton, illustrated by David Witt. And then there's your uh, your uh, creative team. But it's just it's it's this really good. It ended up being so much fun, and it's a it's a floppy. So that means there's only like what two, three, four issues left, and um, it's very clever in places. I'm a very spiritual person, so is Jesse, and that's how we like connected in a way through Star Wars and spirituality, and then com like comic books. Holy shit! You should see his tattoos. He's got some fucking ink. Like he's got Wolverine's nubs on his hands where, where the snick comes out. You know what I mean? It's just like he's like, he's got like, he's like one of, yeah, Jesse Snyder is fucking awesome. And I'm happy in, to, to, to be his like Twitter friend. And if I ever get out to like LA, I'm going to like hit him up and be like, can I buy you lunch? You want to hang out for a couple of hours? Can we just hang out for a minute and go to, yeah, take me to your comic book shop. Let's hang out. If anyone's out there is ever in Boston, you want to go to a, if there's time, let me know. But um, this is King of Kings. It's about a, um, a holy battle of the bands. It's like you have Jesus and the apostles as the running champions 
versus Odin in the in the in his trio of like Thor and Loki. <laughs> it's pretty fucking fun. Muhammad is always surrounded by his entourage. We never see him. He's this effulgence that comes from behind. <laughs> Fucking clever. Clever is all shit. I love it. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Um, there's like this Kool-Aid man who is like Scientology. He's Scientology. There's Krishna, the one-man band. And he's got a couple of different arms and legs. That's signed by Jesse Blaze Snyder right there. Um, <laughs> this is John Lennon, Ozzy Osbourne, Buddha mashup right there. I mean, so this just like runs the gamut on rock and roll culture and spirituality culture. And it's got the visual feel of like of Mad Magazine and old, you know, um, in old underground comics, it's really fun. And um, when Jesse uh, puts out a second chance campaign, I will uh, I will let you all know. We have to get to our show notes because Pikachu, my executive producer, demands it. I'm just the talent, and I need to be. Uh, be earning my keep reading what he writes down so cancellations real cancel culture and we have the we have seriousness like ed piscor then we have inconveniences such as and that star wars girl John Malin, Shane Davis, Ethan Manskyver, all getting in. Uh, apparently, Gary Nerdrotic getting on, you know, his press pass taken away from San Diego Comic Con. But real life cancel culture happening right before our eyes. I'm already bought into two con to cons coming up this summertime in Boston, uh, June 16th through 19th, I believe, is Boston Fan Expo, the junket, the big junket tour that goes from Dallas to Edmonton to, to, to Boston to Denver. It's, in, it's actually in Denver, like, soon. And Ripperverse, Eric July is there and he's able to sell his wares. Yeah, that, that's a pregnant pause. I'm waiting for the, the other shoe to drop. I was listening for it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, um, there's no use in like it's good, it's it's wow. So it is. It still exists. It really does. I mean, I've got tickets. I, I've got passes to two cons coming up. Um, I was going to go to Dallas Fan Expo second week of June, but Boston Fan Expo. This is my hometown. I'm here already. I already have bought my my three day VIP pass. I think I upgraded this year. I got the middle tier instead of the usual three day pass. Like, like, do I get a bypass the line or something or something stupid? Can I still upgrade? I bet I maybe I could. Maybe I want to get some. There are a couple of signatures I want to get this year. I tell you that much. Uh, it's it's Vincent D'Onofrio and Marissa Tome, and they start in a. Together in a 2000 sci fi rom com called Happy Accidents. And I want, you know, that's, I would like a picture with both of them if you like, and put it in my DVD. That'd be, that would be, that would be a nice memento. Like, who the fuck remembered this movie? I did. This guy. This, this, this is a fun movie. Thanks. But like, you know, 
I go to cons. Don't you? Do you go to cons? Let me know in the chat. Let me know in this in, in the comment sections. Do you go to cons? And I'm like, I've been going to cons. Kind of. Okay, I'm in a city, like so. It's like you don't travel to them. I remember they're always like in hotels, and I guess that's what they were always were, and kind of still are. I mean, like, because convention centers are just like, in a way, extensions of hotels. Um, if you follow that, um. The first convention I ever went to was in 1992 or three. It was at the Sheridan. Um, um, that was by Legal Seafoods, and um, it's it'll come back to me later. But um, it was it wasn't what we thought it was. There was just like. It was a sci-fi convention. It was more Star Trek than anything. I ended up buying something. I bought a what it was resin and it was painted, but it was a um, it was a communicator badge, and I got two. One was the the new. It was new then. It went from the oval background to the hexagonal background of the the communicator badge, but also it had. Uh, I got the one with the future enterprise of from uh, from all good things where you your rank pips were included on your um, your communicate your combat your com pen your com badge as we say. Um, I also bought at that con uh, a VHS copy of the Star Wars holiday special and. I had that for a while. <laughs> that was fun. That was that was that was that was legendary because I saw it as a kid, and to have it that, 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 that was it was a bootleg. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Um, but cons, no. I mean, geez. So. John Malin cannot go to C2E2 because he would make that an unsafe space. In Chicago? I've been to Chicago. I haven't been in a few years, but I love Chicago. Um, but it's I grew up in a city. I grew up in Boston, so I understand Chicago. It's just like it's a city. You have to have your head in a swivel. And not getting yourself into situations where you're going to find yourself in trouble. Be safe at all times. It's a fucking city. Um, wow. I mean, that's just... It blows my mind. Because I mean, I'm a big fan of them. I love Ethan. I love John. I love Shane. I love Anna. I love Cecil. I love that side of the aisle. I mean... I also love Friday Night Tights, and I love Nerd Brodick. And I really used to like as not so much anymore. I mean, but that's okay. I mean, like, I respect the hell out of them. Fucking pronouns! <laughs> I can do that. I mean, like, uh, just, yeah, I mean, um, no, I watched this show for a while. I have his sweatshirt a red hoodie sweatshirt with the old logo you know that looks more like rugrats um but it's a medium and that's like when i lost a lot of weight during lockdown um i also had surgery last november and it was hard to it's a wish me well i'm going to try to get this weight back off But not today. <laughs> um, I wanted to go to C2E2 because I love going to Chicago. Uh, I love going to Cubs games. I love that afternoon Thursday Cub game. Uh, that's my favorite 
you know, just like I love going to a baseball game in another city. I remember the first time I went to see the Cubbies on an afternoon game, they lost. So the second and third time I did that, when they won both times, the whole fucking big thing at the end of the game with the W's and in, in the white flag with the the, the, the Navy W and just, I mean, it's 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 impressive. I, I really dug, the, you know. Hey, hey, hello, my brother, Thomas Gilkey, and Pika Shades. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Good to see you. Um, but I, um, let's see. I think the crew isn't showing the CT there for a reason. Maybe. Yeah, sure. I mean, loopholes are loopholes. Sure. Really, I, one thing I do like is John Malin's fury. Um, that he's not given the same opportunity to go to a professional trade show because of politics. I love the cut of his jib. I, I, I like that guy. I respect the hell out of him. And um, no, thank you. And then, yeah, it's every yeah, sure. I mean, and also it's you know it's the, it's a big show in the mid in the Midwest too. You know, it's it's not New York, it's not Boston, it's not Atlanta. You know that's Dragon Con, and uh, or, or Orlando, a meg. You know there's Mega Con. You know, you know what's in the what's in the Middle East? Well, everyone all leads ro go to Rome. All leads ro all roads lead to Chicago in the Middle East. Seriously, I fucking love Chicago. Like Chicago, beautiful women. I love Chicago. You know, Chicago skinny, please, not L.A. skinny. I mean, Chicago women. They all smoke cigarettes too, so that's kind of a turnoff. But um. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, they just like, wow, you, they, 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 I go to cons. There are tables. It, it, if the, it's not as though they're just taking away a table from a small creator that might or not, might not sell. They might be bringing in more foot traffic for people that could go to this con. They could sell more concessions. They can sell more tickets. They could sell, you know, more parking spaces. You know, the, you know, the, you, you might have an extra, you know, 100 people with all those 100 extra needs for a bottle of water or even a hot lunch. You know what I mean? Or just like, you know, just shit like that. I mean, running an event. How, how, how are, qui bono? How are you benefiting from excluding parts of your paying customer base? I mean, the whole point was just to get new customers, not to exclude the pre-existing customers. Or is this proof of that? I don't have answers. All I have are more questions, as usual, here on this show with my fucking pronouns. <laughs> Sorry. What else was on the list? Yeah, so C2E2. It's like I'm not going to it. I was going to go to it, but because I, I love going to Chicago, I really do. I love going to the AI, the Art Institute of Chicago. Their 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 museum. Um, they get great restaurants. It's a fun city, and um, be safe. And Chicago is not a safe space. So why would the con be? And why would the con be an unsafe space because of Ethan Manskyver, Shane Davis? John Malin or Anna, that Star Wars girl. Or even San Diego taking away Gary's press per permit. And he's got one million 
YouTube subscribers. It's true. I mean, geez. I mean, what, what matters is, you know, mm, wow. Oh, well, we, we call that the culture of war. They, they call that the culture war. <laughs> Thomas is my real life friend. He's a great guy. He's going to this. He's going to the Sox game tomorrow. He offered me a ticket too. I just can't. I can't go to the. Tomorrow is Marathon Monday here in Boston, and um, I've experienced Marathon Monday in town a, a bunch of times. I mean, I, it's hectic. There are a lot of people there, but. Um, but have fun tomorrow. I, I love watching baseball. Thomas and I went to a game last year. Well, we'll get to one this year. We will. Totally. AL took took your kids to Chicago. They were bored of their minds. Did you go to Graham Crackers? That's like the the, the comic book shop. There's yeah, there was a comic book shop that was around the corner from the AI, the Art Institute of Chicago, the museum, and right where Route 66 starts, where the elevated subway is as well. It's just charming shit. What? <laughs> <laughs> Fucking pronouns! No, I mean, come on, man. Okay, I know as is, you know, he's like, I've been watching him for a couple of years. Is my favorite shit is him with Robert Meyer Burnett doing the doing the prisoner, and I also like loved watching him play Witcher Three. And um, I don't know, it's just like this this um, the fact that they couldn't forgive Ethan Van Skyver right off the bat. Just be like, okay, let's just like you know this. A lot of this would have fucking the whole zeros comment. Like, it's just, oh, come on. Just like, he's just fucking talking shit. Come on. If you're going to hold that, that's just, that's a bit much. It's excessive. <laughs> Ethan's out there, like, just doing, like, the Howard Stern thing. Come on, man. It really, it's, it's not worth it. Really. And just the fact that no one has come together against cancel culture. That hurt my feelings. Forget about it, Jake. It's Chinatown. It's Chinatown. Um, it says to talk about dark force theory with a question mark. We'll wrap up the show with dark force theory. Um, I've been meaning to say something about dark force theory. If you have you watched the three body problem on Netflix, you might start to know what. Dark Forest Theory is all about. And it's a terrifying science fiction premise. Oh, no. Gee. The TV, the, the, the fireplace went out. I didn't feed the fire. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> But awesome. I mean, um, Dark Forest Theory. I mean, okay, it comes from a book called The Three Body Problem. Here we are. Hmm. Oh my goodness! I would this would be a lot simpler if we had a, you know, a um, a producer like you, Pikachu. The Three Body Problem is a novel 
It's a story by Chinese science fiction. You know we're reading this from. You guessed it. The Wiki. All right. There's a story by Chinese science fiction author Xin Liu. The first novel in the Remembrance of Earth's Past trilogy. The series portrays a fictional past, present, and future where an Earth encounters an alien civilization from a nearby system of three sun-like stars orbiting one another. A representative, a representative example of the three-body problem in orbital mechanics. Now, that means... Um, what does that mean? Well, that means, like, your center of gravity is somewhere in between all three stars. And each one of those stars may or may not have planetary satellites around in, in orbit around each. So each time the stars, all three stars, have their own apogee and perigees in, around their shared center of gravity, which is not in the center of each one of those stars. It's it's in the center of, you know, a space. I mean, the planets all travel chaotically. There is not a consistency such as in our placid little Eden here in our solar system we call Sol. We have one body. We have one solar mass, one star, and the plane, we call it the ecliptic. It's the plane of the solar system. All the planets revolve basically around the same plate. <laughs> so in the three-body system, you have three suns, and so everything's a bit more chaotic and unpredictable. Therefore, a civilization on one of these star... Uh, it's our closest stellar neighbor, Alpha Centauri, which is a, a you know a three-body system, four light years away. This is hard science fiction, so everything I just said matters because it's all about relativistic motion. There's barely any you know faster than light, um, but there's hope. There's the human race will go on. Uh, I've read it twice now in the past, you know, eight years. It's a, what a, what a, what a wonderful book, but dark forest theory is so scary. It scared the hell out of me. It's, it's fiction. And um, I'm just going to riff a little bit. And I, I don't mean to bore you or being, I don't mean to yap too much. Um, but one thing I want to do is talk about dark forest theory just for a minute. And this is this is the right place to talk about it because it's like, you know, this, here's the show. We're talking about fiction. And it's it's actually a, a Netflix show right now. Now, dark forest theory, it's about cosmic sociology. And it's about admitting maybe frailty. The universe is a dark forest. That's your metaphor, okay? The universe is a dark forest. So any broken branch, footstep, um, not properly extinguished campfire, anything that you leave behind could is going to alert someone else that you're out there in the dark forest with. You don't want to do that. Because you become a rival for the limited resources available in our shared space.
dark forest theory. It's in your best interest to go and eliminate the competition before they become a threat to you. Bef you know, it's empirical. It's about resources, about saving resources and saving your culture and perpetuating your people. Even if the civilization that you become aware of that is techno is not as technologically advanced as you, still you have to respect two mitigating factors. Um, one called chain of suspicion. You know, it's 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 a it's a logical framework, but the second one would be this this thing about re, you know finality of resources and um, you can and I, and I, the second thing would actually be the sorry the technological explosion it's chain of suspicion and technological explosion that this civilization has had had to technological explosions enough to merit you know being recognized as a intelligence in the cosmos that a technological explosion if you're exposed to another alien culture you're going to have a technological explosion that will make you could potentially equal to and advanced over yourself. So it's in your best interest preemptively just to take the other thing out. You can't, because of chain of suspicion, you cannot count on the other being benign and friendly. That's that. It's not a safe space. Dark forest is perhaps ideologically the opposite of what we consider safe space. And you can look at the limited resources of our fandom, of the convention spaces, of being able to sell direct to consumers or in the marketplace of these print publications and of art and of story. Wow. I believe in dark forest theory. I'm sorry. I do. I regret to inform you that I believe in dark forest theory. It scares the hell out of me. But I see the, the truth in it. That's so scary. I mean, I haven't had a piece of sci-fi really affect me since like, God Emperor of Dune. Dune. The fourth one, not this one. That's the first one. Uh, God, there I get I got a copy of God Emperor of Dune on the bookshelf somewhere over there. Um, because it just it has these like you know philosophical ideas, but this whole thing about dark forest there, you know, it ended up saving the human race in this fiction, insular to this fictional world. I had never heard. Dark forest theory is the solution for what you know is the fer the Fermi paradox. The Fermi paradox is this: if there, are, you know, this is an infinite universe with infinite numbers of galaxies and of of, of planets, and therefore civilizations. Where are they? Why haven't they made contact with us? Dark forest theory is a solution to the Fermi paradoxes. It's a hardcore one, too. It's uncomfortable. 
but gee wow it'll blow your mind that's that thank you so very much uh we're gonna wrap it up it's it's been we've been doing the comics talk talking about science fiction talking about comic books we've got lots of comic books what comic books are you buying what are you what are you picking up what are you putting down let us know in the comment section uh please like and subscribe i would love to earn your subscription and don't be surprised if you start seeing more advertisements in our content in the near future where we are we are going into the future together thank you so very much uh here at your dojo for tactical and practical spirituality so stay tuned in Incel cast is over. We are moving on to something else. We might be going to something called Pimp Cast, where you have to keep your pimp hands strong. That's right. <laughs> well, thank you so very much. God bless. Namaste. Good luck. And we will see you again in those funny pages. Ciao. Bye bye. Ha <laughs> ha.